Hello, good people. It's Professor Wachtel. We continue our discussion of Plato's Ideal City, a thought experiment to reveal justice. Having proposed the creation of the ideal city in thought, Socrates puts to Glaucon and Adimantus the question of, where do we start with the ideal city? Um, what type of people does it consist of? How many people does it need at, at its very beginning? And the answer is surprisingly simple, really just a few. We start from the provision of necessities for the residents of the city. What do people need in a society? Well, they need food, they need shelter, they need clothing. Their clothing uh, probably consists of uh, shoes as well as things to wear on their body. So we need somebody to make shoes. We need somebody to weave cloth, somebody to make the cloth into garments, and we need people to build houses, and we need people to grow food, and there begins the ideal city. At the point at which Socrates has elicited these first very few uh, types of members of the ideal city, he asks a really, really important question to Glaucon and Adimantus. The question is this, and much hangs on the answer to this question, although its full significance is not known until much later in the discussion. The question is, among these few citizens of the ideal city, should each have a specialized job, or should each do a little bit of each job? Well, to answer this question, the concern that we need to have is what is going to make the city the best possible city. Since this is the ideal city, there isn't any room for less than good anything. So Socrates proposes that it is specialization among the members of the ideal city that leads to goodness. Okay, and here's why. If somebody is dividing their time between growing food and making shoes and making clothes and making shelters, are any of those jobs going to be well done? On the other hand, if a person specializes in making shoes or growing food or making clothing or building houses, Will those jobs be likely to be well done? We can answer the question, and we can see how Socrates answers the question in this way. How many people are really world-class at more than one thing? Very, very few. In today's world, with um, education pretty widely available, it's probably not entirely uncommon that there are some people who are really, really great at more than one thing. But how many people are really world-class at more than one thing? A very, very small number. The people who are the best at something tend to focus on that pursuit, and the focus on the pursuit allows for excellence. The focus on the pursuit enables excellence. In the pages that follow, Socrates and his interlocutors pursue this notion of the principle of specialization driving the ideal city through a wide variety of different occupations that members of the city would have. You can look at pages 10 through 13 to see the wide variety of specialized occupations in the ideal city. The farmer, Socrates proposes, will not make his own plow or mattock, whatever a mattock is, or other implements of agriculture. So we need tool makers. Neither will the builder make his own tools, so we need tool makers, and in like manner, the weaver and the shoemaker will not be making their own tools. So making tools is itself a specialized job. Even the um, 
process of agriculture is, uh, requires many different specialized jobs. For example, uh, people who grow food from the earth are not engaged in the same kind of agriculture as those who work with livestock. So we will need uh, neat herds, shepherds, and other herdsmen. And these will be required so that the husbandman or farmer will have uh, oxen to pull the plow. As our productivity is growing, we might need to get some supplies from another city. So we need people who will engage in trade with members, uh, uh, people living in other cities. We need people who will engage in trade with those who live in other cities. And that is its own specialized type of job. The moving of goods, the selling of goods, requires a whole variety of occupations. Merchants, sailors, salesmen, retailers, all the way on down to hirelings, that is, people who sell their labor. What we have here is an economy. Let us consider, Socrates says, first of all, what will be their way of life, that is, what will be the way of life of the members of the ideal city so far, of the residents of the ideal city so far. Will they not produce corn and wine and clothes and shoes and build houses for themselves? And when they're housed, they will work in summer, commonly stripped and barefoot, but in winter, substantially clothed and shod. They will feed on barley meal and flour of wheat, baking and kneading them, making noble cakes and loaves. These they will serve up on a mat of reeds or on clean leaves, themselves reclining the while upon beds strewn with yew or myrtle. And they and their children will feast, drinking of the wine which they have made, wearing garlands on their heads, and hymning the praises of the gods in happy converse with one another. And they will take care of their families, and they will take care that their families do not exceed their means, having an eye to poverty or war. What kind of life is this? It seems like a, a good life, a secure life, but it is a simple life. If we pay attention to the um, types of material provisions that the people in the ideal city have, as Socrates relates it so far, they are not eating fancy foods. They are eating bread made of barley meal and flour. They are not sitting at fancy tables. They are instead eating off of mats of reeds or clean leaves. What makes things well decorated? Uh, it seems like they're using plants. You, myrtle. I'm not. I'm not quite sure if they use them. You and myrtle for uh, their scent properties or for their appearances. But either way, they are are some kind of plant decoration or uh, a garnish. And what do they do? Mainly, they spend time with one another. They, they, they worship, they are in happy converse with one another, and their, their main concern is just living a nice, simple life. And that's great. But Glaucon quickly notes, and this is an interesting point, that is, people often have a desire for some pleasure, especially once they have been well provided for in their simple lives, once they're okay, then their attention turns to things that are specifically done for enjoyment. So Glaucon says, you've not yet given them a relish to their meal. True, Socrates says, I'd forgotten. Of course they must have a relish, salt and olives and cheese, and they'll boil roots and herbs such as country people prepare for dessert. We shall give them figs and peas and beans and they will roast myrtle berries and acorns at the fire, drinking in moderation. And with such a diet, they may be expected to live in peace and health to a good old age and bequeath a similar life to their children after them. The relish. C consider the following. If you have ever eaten a meal at a place like Chipotle, would it be a little strange if you said to the person preparing your burrito, I'll have the tortilla and the rice and maybe some beans. Oh, and that's it. This would be a burrito that would 
free you from hunger, if you're hungry, but it would be a hard burrito to enjoy. What do you want when you go to Chipotle? Well, I cannot speak for everyone, but I want the guacamole. And I want the tasty salsa. And that's my personal Chipotle formula. I know other people like sour cream and cheese and corn. We desire foods that we can enjoy. So very quickly, the ideal city turns to the production not only of bare necessities, but of items that have the specific purpose of generating pleasure. These items are not only food items, and I'm not going to go through all of the uh, luxurious items that Socrates and his interlocutors discuss, but in, in, in brief, they talk about things like uh, sofas, tables, nice furniture, dainties, perfumes, things that smell nice, fancier clothes, uh, gold and ivory, uh, what else, what else? Uh, entertainers, of course. Um, entertainment is a great pleasure. So um, Socrates speaks of poets and their attendant train of rhapsodists, players, dancers, contractors, also makers of diverse kinds of articles, including women's dresses. Uh, and very soon he is on to people who have the job of taking care of the children of others. We, he is on to the job of people who do each other's hair, and our society, our ideal state, assuming that all these items are well made by specialized artisans, craftspeople, producers of goods and services, our ideal city is now rich. With riches come, the, come a couple of other needs. Now we need doctors, presumably having gotten extremely well fed. There is another type of person that the ideal city now needs. Imagine this. The ideal city is rich and growing. And growing, it perhaps needs more space. So it would need to stake out some more territory and claim it and protect it. Furthermore, it may well be the case that some other people living over a hill see us in the ideal city now, or see the members of the ideal city now, enjoying their materially well-provided for life, and decide they would like to try and take some of it by force. So it seems we have a clear need in the ideal city for guardians, people who have the specific job of protecting the ideal city. Guardianship is as much a specialized function as anything else. It cannot be done well unless the people doing it are well trained, know what they're doing, are capable. Guardianship is a specialized job. It turns out that thinking about guardianship as a specialized job is a bit more high stakes and complicated than thinking about house building, for example, as a specialized job. What are the features required of good guardians? Well, they need to be able to fight. They need to be able to work well amongst themselves. They need to be able to handle weapons. They need to be able to face danger. Could it be that having a specialized group of people like that around might be a little dangerous? Well, perhaps, well, not perhaps, certainly it, they could be a little bit dangerous if they are not the right kind of people doing the job. That is, if they are not the ideal guardians. Consider any country that has fallen into military dictatorship. That is where the people, the class of people, who are strongest and best trained in fighting, have taken over the country. What should ideal guardians of the ideal city be like? Plato explains the nature of the ideal guardians with an animal reference. Ideal guardians should be like dogs. Now, I don't know if any of you watching have dogs. When the owner of a dog comes home, what do most dogs do? They are thrilled. They are so immediately overjoyed by the 
by the presence of their owner. They're jumping up and down, they're licking them, they are absolutely thrilled to see their owner. They know who their friends are. In contrast, if an unfamiliar person shows up at the doorstep, what does the dog of the house do? Barks immediately, and very often not a happy bark, a bark that says, here comes danger, I am now alarmed. We need guardians like that. I wonder if you have seen, and this is, this is not a dog reference, but it's a cat reference. Many people think that cats are not as um, emotionally connected to their owners as, as dogs are, but perhaps some cats are. I wonder if you've seen the video that went viral several years ago of a, um, of a family cat protecting a young boy. A little boy, about three to four years old, is playing in the driveway on his tricycle when from around the corner of one of the family vehicles comes a large dog. The dog weighs about 50 pounds. The four-year-old boy does not weigh nearly 50 pounds. The large dog gets its jaws on the little boy's leg and starts pulling the, the screaming little boy into the street. Of course, the noise that the boy is making attracts the boy's mother to open the door of the house. She looks out, and before you know it, the next thing you see coming out the door is this flash. What is it? It's the family cat. The cat just shoots itself at the dog, gets its claws in the dog's eyes, gets the dog to release the boy, and then the cat chases the dog back around the corner. We need guardians, Plato would say, like that cat. We need guardians that know friend from foe, and guardians that will use all their force to defend their friends against their foes. How do we get such guardians? Plato has a lot to say about this matter. In this context, it's probably wise not to go into too much detail with the raising of the guardians. In a nutshell, Socrates proposes, guardians need to be brought up from the youngest age to be maximally devoted to the ideal city and raised in such a way that their character is unshakably solid and it is unthinkable for them to betray the city and the people who it is their job to protect. In Book 3 of the Republic, which is not part of our reading, Socrates and his interlocutors in the discussion realize that guardianship is a more complicated job than initially appreciated. They separate the guardian class into two groups. One group that has the job of making the laws and another group that has the job of enforcing the laws. So now our ideal city has three classes. It has the largest class devoted to producing goods and services. We can call this class the producers. It has two smaller classes. One class devoted to making the laws. We can call this class the rulers. And another class devoted to enforcing the laws. We can call this class the auxiliaries. That is the auxiliaries to the rulers, the helpers of the rulers. It is not their job to make the laws, but it is their job to enforce the laws. It's commonly asked, to what are the rulers in Plato's ideal city accountable? To answer this question requires that we go beyond the scope of uh, Plato's philosophy of human nature as expressed in the Republic. An answer, in a nutshell, is that Plato's rulers of the ideal city are accountable to that which is most real and most true. Plato's discussion in the Republic occasionally 
shifts into metaphysical territory. That is, it shifts into territory where the concern is questions of the nature of reality. The rulers of Plato's ideal city are what Plato's character Socrates calls philosopher kings. They seek to know, that is, they devote their lives to studying what is most real and what is most true and making laws on the basis of that knowledge. It is this devotion to what is most real and most true that makes the rulers of the ideal city ideal rulers. It is this devotion that makes the rulers of the ideal city incorruptible. <coughs> Why would devotion to the highest truths make the rulers incorruptible? Consider the following. If you could know what is ultimate, what is most real and most true, would you care very much about earthly goods? I think many people would answer no. If this were a discussion devoted to Plato's metaphysical theory, there would be more opportunity to go into detail about what Plato calls the forms, that is the capital F forms, the most real, most true abstract, perfect, eternal essences of things. For the time being, let us just say this much. The rulers, the philosopher kings, are devoted to the forms. They make laws based on such knowledge, and the auxiliaries have the job of being devoted to the enforcement, the actual practice of the laws made by the philosopher kings. This is the structure, this, this is the three-class structure of Plato's ideal city. It is an aristocracy with the smallest group, the rulers, making the laws. A slightly larger group, the auxiliaries, enforcing the laws made by the rulers, and everyone else producing goods and creating services for the general enjoyment of human life. Is Plato's three-class ideal city an aristocracy? It certainly is, but it is not an aristocracy that is much like aristocracy as we tend to conceive it in today's world, or really the world of the last 1,000 years. Plato's aristocracy is an aristocracy of knowledge. It is not an aristocracy of wealth. It is an aristocracy of knowledge. With the three classes of the ideal city well established, Socrates and his interlocutors are ready to consider a key question. From where do the virtues of the ideal city derive? They consider four virtues. The ideal city will have to be wise, valiant, temperate, and just. Would it be able to be an ideal city? Would it be an ideal city if it lacked wisdom, courage, that is valiance, temperance, or justice? It could not be. So the ideal city is going to have to have these virtuous characteristics. From where does it derive each virtue? From where does the ideal city derive its wisdom? This question Socrates and his interlocutors deal with quickly and easily. The ideal city's wisdom derives from the rulers. It's the rulers who are the knowledge class. It is the rulers who have the job of making the laws to the extent that the ideal city possesses wisdom. It possesses wisdom as a result of its having the ideal rulers. 
From where does the ideal city derive its courage or valiance? I am using courage and valiance as synonyms. What is courage? Courage is the virtue of being able to handle dangerous situations. Whose job is it to handle dangerous situations in the ideal city? This is the job of the auxiliaries. The auxiliaries are the members of the ideal city who have the job of facing danger should danger arise. If invaders from outside try and attack the ideal city, it is the auxiliary's job to prevent them from being successful. If a person within the ideal city breaks the laws, threatens others, threatens society, it is the auxiliary's job to enforce the laws and protect the members of the ideal city. So these first two virtues, wisdom and courage, have a simple correspondence to a class of the city. Temperance is a bit more complicated. The discussion of temperance requires discussion of what temperance is. According to Socrates and his interlocutors, temperance is control of desires, or one might say self-control. What is it that makes the ideal city self-controlled? This is a different question than what makes a person self-controlled. That question will come up later. But what makes a city self-controlled? The answer that Socrates and his interlocutors give is each class obeying the class that is higher. Or, put another way, the worse class obeying the better. The temperance of the ideal city results from the ordered relationship of the classes that make up the ideal city. Most truly, Socrates says, then we may deem temperance to be the agreement of the naturally superior and inferior as to the right to rule of either, both in states and individuals. We come now to justice. How do we define justice in the ideal city? How does the three-part class structure of the ideal city allow us to put a finger on the nature of justice? You remember, Socrates says, the original principle which we were always laying down at the foundation of the state, that one man should practice one thing only, the thing to which his nature was best adapted. Now justice is this principle or a part of it. That is to say, Socrates argues that justice is the principle of specialization. We've been searching for justice, it has been with us all along. We just have yet to appreciate its significance. Justice is the principle of specialization. Many people are surprised by this characterization of justice as specialization. It seems very much unlike what we mean when we use the word justice in ordinary everyday discussion. In ordinary everyday discussion, when we use the word justice, we mean something like this. Legal justice, that is, the fair administration of the law across a variety of citizens. Or we mean something like this. Justice as fairness, that is, justice as the practice of distributing goods according to some standard of fairness. Socrates' characterization of justice as the principle of specialization does not seem to be the, the same thing as that. What we need to appreciate is that Socrates' understanding of justice as specialization focuses on a condition necessary for fair administration legally or fair distribution of goods. So let us think a little bit about what specialization does in 
context of the ideal city. To explain the significance of justice, which Socrates has characterized as doing one's own business and not being a busybody, let us keep in mind that what Socrates says, justice is the ultimate cause and condition of the existence of all other virtues of the ideal city. This, justice, is the only virtue which remains in the state when the other virtues of temperance and courage and wisdom are abstracted, and that this is the ultimate cause and condition of the existence of all of them, and while remaining in them is also their preservative and we were saying that if the three were discovered by us, justice would be the fourth remaining. If we are asked to determine which of these four qualities, that is among justice, wisdom, courage, and temperance, which contributes most to the excellence of the state, Socrates answers that it is justice. Why does he say this? Imagine an ideal state without specialization. Could it be the ideal state? We, it really could not. We would not be able to imagine the ideal state without specialization. Could the producers of the ideal state be the best possible producers without specialization? It seems unlikely. Could the rulers of the ideal state make the best possible laws without being specialized philosopher king, knowledge aristocrats? It seems unlikely. Could, could the auxiliaries be the best possible enforcers of the laws and defenders of the city without being specialized? Again, this seems very unlikely. Thus, Socrates reasons that justice is specialization. It is that which brings about any excellence in the ideal state, and it is that which preserves excellence in the ideal state. Now, this clearly includes the administration of legal justice and the distribution of of goods. Those are various excellences of the ideal state. An ideal state will have a legal system that works as best possible, and an ideal state will allow for appropriate distribution of goods among its members. So Socrates's definition of justice includes our ordinary everyday definition of justice, but goes deeper. Socrates' definition of justice seeks to put a finger on the origin of any goodness, any excellence of the ideal state. Let us test this proposition that justice is specialization, Socrates proposes. Imagine the following. What would happen if members of the producer class started trying to enforce laws on their own. Would the state get better or worse? We, we have relatable examples in our own time of things that go quite wrong when non-law enforcement or non-military people start trying to act like they are law enforcement or military specialists. Likewise, in our time, we have numerous and unfortunate examples of instances in which law enforcement or military people start making their own rules. Do things get better or worse when that happens? We only have to watch the news to know that things get very, very scary when law enforcement officers don't adhere to the law and make up their own rules. Finally, what would happen 
if the rulers of the ideal city decided that they were to suspend their function as rulers and to engage in the activities of the other classes. What would happen to the ideal city's ability to make laws? It would completely deteriorate. Thus, Socrates in The Republic reasons that justice truly is the cause and condition of all other goods in the ideal state. The principle of specialization, that each member of the ideal state and each class of the ideal state should focus on its job, that to which it is best adapted, and to stay out of the jobs of others, this is the ground of goodness in the ideal state. This is justice in Plato's Republic.